final ending to looking out, other parts down below. If Kelly hadn't yelled, I began, if I had let my anger take over, things could have gone terribly wrong. Kelly's intervention probably saved us from a lot of grief. Have you lost your mind, James? Heidi exclaimed. I'm your partner, your other half. I'm the one who's been by your side, raising our kids who seem to forget gratitude. And here you are, upset over someone you barely know. I reached out for Sam, pulling her close. This is nonsense, Dave interjected, visibly upset. We need clarity. What's at the root of all this animosity? Let's gather in the living room, it's time to lay everything out. We should really tidy up first, Kelly suggested. No, it's crucial we understand what's going on, David insisted. Heidi tried to explain from her position on the floor. Enough, the usually jovial Sarah cut in sharply. We've listened to your side. It's time for the truth. Sorry, I need to leave for work, Justin chimed in. Justin, sit back down, I said firmly. Justin, pretending to go to work doesn't change anything, David chimed in. Stay and listen. So, we all settled in the living room, Dave kindling a fire as we gathered around. I was smitten with your mother from the moment I saw her, I started. Back in 1973, I was a 19-year-old student at Central Michigan University. There she was, walking by, and I was mesmerized. Barely five feet tall, with short blonde hair and a stylish cut, and eyes so blue they made the sky seem dull in comparison. Keep it together, Sam muttered. I was so distracted, I walked right into a light pole, I continued, ignoring the interjection. Really, over her, Sam couldn't hide her disbelief. And mom, Sarah probed. She didn't even see me. While others rushed over to help, your mom walked on, oblivious to my plight, I recounted. I later discovered she had been there to meet a tutor for assistance with her English paper and arrived more than 30 minutes late. The tutor had already left. As she turned to head back to her dorm, she crossed paths with me again. And that's how you two met, Sasha chimed in. Can I just tell the story myself? I interjected. The room fell silent, allowing me to continue. No, we didn't actually meet then. I was gathering my things when she accidentally stepped on my hand. It was actually three days later when we officially met. From the moment I saw her, I couldn't stop thinking about her. She embodied a style that was all the rage back then, incredibly slender and embodying an almost ethereal, ambiguous charm. Samantha raised her hand. Sweetheart, this isn't a classroom. If you've got something to say, just say it, I told her. What does ambiguous charm mean? She inquired. It's that kind of celestial, indefinable charm. She was thin, with a very delicate figure, similar to many high-profile models of the time. They all shared this slender silhouette, I explained. So, you were attracted to people who looked quite youthful. She prodded. It was the trend, I replied. But tastes evolve. However, it seems preferences for physical traits remain. You're not being entirely truthful, she countered. It was actually my curves that caught your eye before my face did. Can I continue? I asked, and with a smile, she nodded. Moving on, I recounted stepping out of my English class and seeing her there, with a sparkle in her hair and wearing tall platform shoes. My heart skipped a beat. As I attempted to walk past her, she stepped in front of me. Hey, I need to talk to you, she said. It's all right, I replied. No hard feelings. What are you even talking about? She retorted. Why should I be apologizing to you? Because of that moment the other day. I was so taken aback that I walked straight into a pole, I said. Well, that sounds like a you problem. Seems like a common reaction around me, she quipped, quickly bringing me back to reality. On your way back, you accidentally stepped on my hand, I attempted to explain. Why was your hand even there? She queried, shifting the topic swiftly. I need a favor from you, to write a paper for me. Okay, I agreed, seizing the opportunity. But in return, how about you go out on a date with me? Her laughter filled the air, as if the idea was the most amusing thing she'd ever heard. Feeling both embarrassed and annoyed, I began to walk away, only for her to follow hastily, struggling in her cumbersome shoes. All right, all right, it's urgent, she conceded. One date, in exchange for a paper that'll guarantee me at least a B grade. Deal, I responded. When's the deadline? Tomorrow, she informed me. 25 pages, single-spaced, on a topic of your choosing. It must include at least five footnotes and three citations. She handed me her phone number for follow-up, which, back in those days, meant the landline to her dorm room. The year of mobile phones had not yet dawned on us. Determined, I worked tirelessly to generate ideas, yet time was a luxury I didn't have. Ultimately, I resorted to offering her my own term paper, which wasn't due for another week. After finishing, I contacted her the next morning, and she provided her address for the paper's delivery. Upon arrival and handing it over, she simply said, thanks, and began to leave. Hold on, I called out, stopping her in her tracks. What about the date we agreed on? Returning with a smile, she placed the meticulously typed document on a table inside her doorway and rejoined me outside. In that era, the absence of word processors meant each page was tediously typed on a typewriter, a true labor. Look, she began, her tone a mix of amusement and seriousness. Did you honestly believe I was committed to that idea? My schedule is packed for the next few months. 
But consider this, the essence of dating is to catch someone's attention, to see if there's potential compatibility, right? I suppose, I replied. Well, she began, her voice laced with a nonchalant air. I meet a lot of people. Most of them don't leave much of an impression. But you, you've caught my eye. Consider that a big deal. Next time we cross paths, I might just acknowledge you with a nod. Trust me, that's enough for others to take an interest in you. Then, she disappeared back into her building, leaving behind a swirl of thoughts as she took the newspaper with her. I was left there, processing her words, under the curious gaze of my children who were alternating their attention between me and the door Heidi had vanished through. What a piece of work, David couldn't help but comment. Dad, you let her walk all over you, Sarah chimed in, her tone mixing disappointment with disbelief. I remember everyone thought Heidi was destined for the spotlight, I explained, trying to paint the picture of that era. The modeling industry was just starting to boom. Even though the paychecks then were modest compared to today's standards, it was considered quite lucrative at the time. A few months had passed when Heidi approached me again on campus. Hey James, she greeted, as if no time had passed. It's been three months. Your lucky night has arrived. Confused, I asked, my lucky night for what? To take me out, she stated plainly, as though it was the most natural conclusion. What do you mean? I pressed, my curiosity peaked. Since our last encounter, I had heard quite a bit about Heidi. Before the era of social media and the internet, you got to know people through word of mouth. And the consensus was clear, Heidi had a reputation for using people. Everyone I respected advised me to move on and find someone else. Plus, I already had plans that evening. But Heidi had a persuasive way about her. I had been excited about attending a KISS concert at the Olympia Stadium that night, even having an extra ticket I had tentatively offered to my best friend. In a bold move, Heidi took my hand, creating a moment of unexpected intimacy that caught me completely off guard. My plans for the evening, and my loyalty to my friend, suddenly seemed negotiable. So, what time should we meet? She inquired, already assuming the change in my plans. Six o'clock, I found myself saying. A concert starts at 7.30, with a local band, The Rockets, opening. She looked at me, a hint of mischief in her eyes. What are you talking about, Jimbo? She teased, drawing me further into her unpredictable world. I'm taking you to see. Kiss, I announced with excitement. She couldn't contain her laughter. Are you serious? She chuckled. Why on earth would we want to go see a band famous for their makeup and wild antics? That's not music, it's just loud and chaotic. She mimicked the band's signature moves, shouting, shout it, shout it, shout it out loud. Time for a party. Then, she mockingly stuck out her tongue. Happy now. She teased. That's your KISS concert experience. Now we can plan something more meaningful. Let's meet at your dorm at 10. Don't forget to bring some wine. Heidi, we can't drink wine, I reminded her. I'm 19, and you're only 20. It's not allowed. Really? And you've never had a drink. She probed. When I confirmed, she simply shook her head in disbelief and walked away, muttering under her breath. So there I was, faced with a choice. Do I go see my favorite band with friends, joining thousands of fans for an unforgettable night? Or do I ditch that to spend time with an unpredictable woman? It felt like a pivotal moment, deciding between two very different paths. I think you know which path I chose. If I had stuck to the safe route, I wouldn't be here sharing this story. I opted for the adventure, meeting Heidi at the agreed time. She was punctual, which was out of character for her, and that should have been a clue. That night was a series of firsts for me, including my first taste of alcohol. It was a cheap, sweet wine, and it did not end well for me or Heidi's outfit. Despite the mess, she didn't leave. That night shifted my view of her. She even kissed me afterwards, calling herself my girlfriend. I didn't understand half of what was happening, but I was too caught up in the moment to care. Our connection deepened, despite the initial awkwardness and the remnants of my earlier sickness. She guided my hand, it got intense. After a bit, she slid my hand under her skirt, murmuring about her longing for me, insisting on a desire that seemed absent. It was an odd moment, her words painting a picture far from reality. Despite my unease, I was quick to notice the disconnect. Her assurances were as barren as a desert, starkly contrasting the intensity she claimed. Her touch ventured into my territory, sending a shockwave of excitement through me. The moment her grip firmed, I was engulfed in an electrifying sensation. As she attempted to undress me, a look of concern flashed across her face. It dawned on me much later that my inexperience was glaringly obvious, not to mention her surprise at my size. However, the situation escalated quickly, leading to an abrupt and somewhat embarrassing end that left her less than thrilled. The outcome was a chaotic mess, her makeup smearing, transforming her look into something out of a failed art project. It was an incident both of us wished to erase, yet she pressed on, despite the clear discomfort. Her persistence faded as the ordeal turned farcical, dampening the initial thrill for me. Yet, she continued, motivated by reasons unknown to me at the time. When we attempted once more, her cautious approach hinted at a mismatched past, not from a lack of experience on her part, but rather the challenge I unexpectedly posed. Eventually, the situation steadied, evolving from its clumsy start to a moment of genuine connection. 
offering a profound sense of discovery and personal growth I had never felt before. It was a turning point, marked by innocence and a significant shift in my understanding of myself and relationships. I felt like I was at top of the world. Anyway, she shared a clumsy farewell and slipped out of my dorm. I lay awake, hoping to drift into dreams filled with our recent closeness, but sleep eluded me. Suddenly, my door burst open, revealing every guy on my floor, their expressions a mix of awe and curiosity. Word had gotten out about our night, and even Heidi's discreet exit hadn't gone unnoticed. They crowded around, hungry for details and eager for her contact, hoping for their own chance. I stood firm, refusing to share her number, insisting she was off-limits to them. Marlon Hillebrew, always keen to stir trouble, couldn't hold his tongue. Sounds like you're not the only one she's close to. If she's everyone's friend, why not share with your buddies here? He challenged. Though we stopped short of a physical altercation, the air crackled with our silent animosity. The following day was a roller coaster, starting with a euphoric high, only to plummet into anxiety by nightfall. Early in the morning, Heidi's call, filled with tears and anger, jolted me. You've betrayed my trust, she accused before abruptly ending the call. Confused and troubled, I pondered over her words, realizing the issue must stem from our intimacy becoming public knowledge among my friends. Despite my attempts to apologize, her initial refusal to hear me out left me feeling bewildered and wronged, as I hadn't spread the news myself. Her second call, equally tearful, hit me harder. The depth of her distress revealed a more serious concern. I'm so sorry, Heidi, I said, my voice tinged with desperation. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. They just overheard. It's not about them knowing, she clarified through her tears. It's us, and now. Now there's more at stake. Confused, I pushed for clarity. What's wrong? Between sobs, she shared the news that would change everything. I'm pregnant, she revealed, her voice breaking. My life felt like it was unraveling the moment she broke the news. Dreams of engineering and revolutionizing automotive design seemed to fade into the background. I was speechless, simply sitting there, phone in hand. Remember, this was the 70s, a time when remnants of a more conservative era lingered. Back then, the idea of a young, unmarried woman facing pregnancy was significant news, stirring much more controversy than it would in the years to follow. What's our plan? I inquired. We've got two options, she retorted. We either tie the knot or you find the funds for a termination. We'll visit the clinic to figure out costs. My mother will take us. All right, I responded. Which path are we choosing? I lean towards the termination, she confessed. I have aspirations in modeling. I'm not ready to alter my body or embrace motherhood. I do love you, James, but marriage isn't on my radar yet. When is this happening? I questioned, oblivious to the impending dilemma. We're coming to get you in 15 minutes, she informed me. Meeting Heidi's mother for the first time, I sensed an anomaly. Heidi was starkly different from her parents, to an almost suspicious degree. Her mother, a kind-hearted woman with a robust figure, initially viewed me with skepticism. At the clinic, while enduring cold stares from Heidi's mom, I made small gestures of goodwill, offering coffee and engaging in polite conversation about my future and my intentions towards Heidi. Despite Heidi's insistence on a termination, her mother seemed to prefer me over Heidi's past acquaintances, hinting that perhaps I could bring some stability into her life. Post-consultation, it felt as though I was already part of the family, discussing future support until I could complete my engineering degree. The doctor's entrance, papers in hand, marked a pivotal moment. How long have you missed your period, Heidi? He inquired. Three weeks, she whispered, having confirmed her suspicions with a home test. What followed was unexpected. Heidi's mom, overcome with emotion, reacted sharply. I was ushered out, leaving behind a scene of turmoil. After the dust settled, Heidi emerged, apologetic. The clinic's atmosphere had shifted noticeably, with mixed looks of sympathy and bewilderment directed my way. During the ride home, I ventured to ask Heidi's mom about the earlier commotion, still in the dark about the whole affair. Heidi and I were sitting in the back, our fingers entwined, while her mom glanced back at us with a lit cigarette hanging from her lips. We were cruising down the highway in a car that lacked the basic safety measures, her attention more on us than on the road ahead. It was a risky moment, with her driving guided only by the occasional honk from other vehicles. Jimmy, Heidi attempted to put you in a very tricky situation, her mom revealed. She thought she was pregnant a few weeks ago based on a home test, but those aren't always reliable. Turns out, it was a false alarm, probably influenced by some substances she took. Even if she was pregnant, the timeline wouldn't match up with you. You two only just got together, right? I nodded in agreement. Dear, things don't happen that fast, she explained. Heidi was trying to make you take responsibility for something that wasn't yours. You're a kind person, unlike some of the people she's been with. She thought you'd support her, financially or otherwise, in a situation her usual crowd wouldn't, just to keep her fantasy alive. Hearing this, I couldn't help but tear up, still holding on to Heidi's hand. Her mom noticed and inquired about my tears. You've narrowly avoided a bigger issue, she comforted me. You should feel some relief. What's making you upset? I love her, I admitted. 
I had hoped for a future together. We stopped the car, and in that moment, all three of us shared our emotions, each crying for our own reason, yet it felt cathartic to openly express what we felt. As we continued on our way, Heidi's mom praised my character, a moment that felt like closure. Following that incident, I threw myself into my studies, even as I became the subject of increased attention due to the rumors of my situation with Heidi. Despite this sudden interest from others, my feelings for Heidi didn't waver, unaffected by the ongoing gossip about her and our past connection. From that point on, our interactions were non-existent. If our paths crossed, she would avoid any contact, and my heart ached with every piece of gossip my dorm mates eagerly shared about her. Despite the pain and the path through it, this chapter taught me about resilience, the complexity of human connection, and the unpredictable nature of love. About two months after that disappointing doctor's visit, I'd moved past it. I finally agreed to go out with a kind-hearted girl from one of my classes. She was on the curvier side and wore glasses, but her sweetness was what truly drew me in. Her personality was my main attraction, but I couldn't deny the appeal of her curves. After watching a movie, we were walking back to her dorm, holding hands. She flashed me a smile, stopped, and gently placed her hands on my shoulders, tilting her head back slightly. Back then, that was the universal hint for a kiss. I had been conscientiously chewing gum all day to ensure my breath was fresh. After all, who would want to kiss someone with bad breath? I leaned in, inadvertently catching a glimpse of her, not out of curiosity but to ensure the kiss would be just right, hoping it would lead to another. Her lips were soft and inviting, and I already had my arms wrapped around her. But our kiss was interrupted by the most jarring sound I'd ever heard. What the hell are you doing? Heidi's voice cut through the air. Why is my boyfriend here with another girl in the middle of the street? Is this some kind of experiment? Are you trying to make a statement? Seriously, James, I thought you were content with helping out through donations. Why involve yourself this way too? What do you want, Heidi? I asked, bewildered. Don't play dumb, she retorted. I'm your girlfriend, or did you forget? Heidi, it's been two months since I've seen or heard from you, I countered. And whenever you saw me around, you'd avoid me. That was due to personal issues, James, she claimed. And you're partly to blame. Heidi, that's absurd, I replied. Maybe, she said with a smirk. But the personal issues part. That's on you. I'm two months along, and after a doctor's visit, it's pretty clear what the situation is. I'm at a loss, I said. Considering your recent adventures, how am I supposed to know? No Jimmy James, it turns out, you are the father, she announced with a mix of excitement and urgency. It felt like something out of a TV drama, and I had finally had enough of being in the dark. I demanded a paternity test, alongside a consultation with our doctor. After speaking with both Heidi and her mother, it became clear that back in those days, paternity tests were only conducted after the baby's arrival. Everything seemed to align perfectly, leaving little doubt that I was indeed the father. No to ending the pregnancy, I declared firmly. That's all right, she responded. But I need something more concrete. I want a ring, a visible sign that I'm with my child's father. And I want us to be married before our baby comes into the world. We'll get married on the day our baby is born, I suggested. That way, we can also have a paternity test done to erase any doubts. So, that's what we did. Soon after, we welcomed our child, Dave, into the world. Dave was in daycare while Heidi pursued her modeling dreams, though success seemed elusive. Despite the industry's harsh critiques and constant rejection, my only wish was for Heidi's happiness. My days were filled with work, daycare runs, and caring for Dave at night. I also took up cooking to support Heidi as she tirelessly chased her dreams. Dad, she made it eventually, right. My daughter Sarah asked, referring to the impressive photos from Heidi's modeling days. Sarah, those were more for fun, I confessed. Those magazine covers don't actually say Vogue but vague. I had them created to boost your mom's spirits towards the end of her modeling career. Heidi's journey through the modeling world was tough, with constant reminders that she wasn't what they were looking for. Her initial enthusiasm faded as the industry's demands shifted. To cheer her up, I decided to surprise Heidi with flowers and lunch, celebrating a recent promotion at work. Heidi had often mentioned Phil, a famous photographer who had helped launch many careers. So, when I found out she was with him for a portfolio update, I was ecstatic to see her in action. My excitement, however, quickly turned to disbelief as I stumbled upon a compromising situation. That moment was a stark wake-up call. Heidi stood up and began to approach me, her lack of attire strikingly apparent. Clearly, Phil was next in line for her attention. Glancing around, my hand found a couple of high-end cameras. Despite the discomfort from Heidi's previous action, Phil attempted a gesture, imploring me to reconsider my next move. Please don't, he pleaded. Unmoved, I crashed the cameras onto the office's tiled floor with all my might. A nearby shelf, laden with more cameras, followed suit under my forceful kick. Exiting his office, I could hear Heidi scrambling after me, hastily trying to cover herself amidst the echoes of laughter from the onlookers as we moved down the street. Upon my return home, I ensured Dave was settled for the night before reaching out to Heidi's mother to inform her of the day's events. 
She arrived ahead of Heidi, and as we waited, her disbelief was palpable, marked by her chain smoking in my living room, a sight that seemed all too common in that era. When Heidi finally made her appearance, I took Dave outside, giving Heidi and her mother a moment of privacy. Heidi's pleas for a conversation fell on deaf ears as her mother advised her to respect my need for space, ultimately taking her daughter back with her. Following this, Heidi's attempts to reach out were relentless, flooding our home with calls. A few days later, I reluctantly agreed for Heidi to visit Dave. My plans to occupy myself elsewhere were halted when Heidi expressed her unfamiliarity with caring for Dave, prompting me to stay. Throughout her visit, she expressed remorse and shared her narrative of being coerced by Phil, a story aimed at excusing her actions under the guise of pursuing her modeling career. At the time, her sincerity swayed me, leading to a reconciliation under the promise of never revisiting the past. The subsequent years brought prosperity and the joy of welcoming Sasha into our family, who was adored by all. However, the cycle of betrayal repeated, first with Dave's teacher, and later with our neighbor. Despite the heartache, my commitment to our children made the thought of leaving unbearable. The love for my children anchored me, trapping me in a cycle of forgiveness and hope for a change that seemed increasingly out of reach. I thought our story might end up like those tales of separation you find scattered across the internet, the kind where as soon as the kids are grown enough to leave the nest, the parents follow suit. My feelings for Heidi had changed, she'd wounded me too many times. Yet, after everything we'd been through, parting ways seemed more daunting than staying together. After Heidi's mother passed, she became more grounded. Following the funeral, when everyone else had left, it was just Heidi and I in the quiet of the funeral home. Her mother had been laid to rest in a way that was uniquely her, which made the surreal moment even more poignant. It was then that Heidi turned to me, her expression somber, and began to speak. James, I've been terrible, she admitted. All my life, I've been chasing a sign to prove I'm different, special even. I've been unfaithful, to you and our family, more times than you're aware. And for every instance you discovered, there were many more you didn't. I can't fathom why I do it. You've been nothing but wonderful. I've failed as a partner and a parent, yet you've never turned your back on me. Why? Because I've loved you since the moment we met, Heidi, I replied. And I've loved you too, James, she confessed. Since that day you declared your love for me, despite my attempts to push you away, fearing I wasn't good enough for you. But somehow, destiny brought us back together, and I've spent the last 25 years trying to ruin it. Her sincerity was evident in the tear that trailed down her cheek. James, I'll never hurt you again. You're the only one for me, I promise, she vowed. And I believed her. My resolve to leave melted away, and we shared many happy years following that moment. We dreamed of traveling the world in our early retirement, having raised three wonderful children, and we started by taking small trips, always learning, always exploring. Despite being in our 50s and having been together for over 30 years, we shared a youthful spirit, often surprising others with our adventures. Indeed, those times were filled with joy, the best I'd ever known until then. Our willingness to try new things, like snowboarding instead of skiing with the younger crowd. It was the beginning of the end. Mom had a thing for your ski instructor, didn't she? Dave said, frustration clear in his voice. So much for keeping promises, huh? Can I just finish my story, please? We're almost at the end, I interjected. Sam stood up, then settled down in my lap. I resumed my tale. To clear the air, no, your mom didn't get close to her ski instructor or anyone else, for that matter, except me during our ski trip. That journey, from start to finish, remains one of the most cherished moments of our marriage. Picture spending every single day with the one person you've adored longer than you've understood the concept of love. Waking up to find her in your embrace, sharing tender kisses before playfully nudging her and heading for breakfast. Hitting the slopes for a ski lesson, breathing in the crisp, fresh air. Every glance at her made my heart swell with love. Our afternoons were spent together, returning to our room for moments filled with deep affection until the late hours. Then, preparing for one more ski adventure before dinner. That repetitive bliss was only true for the last day, though. The remainder of our stay was marred by constant disputes, with your mom expressing dissatisfaction over everything. She complained about the chalet being either too hot or too cold, the sunlight being too harsh, the nights too dark, the slopes too steep, and the snow too bright. She seemed to struggle with accepting that she was approaching 60 and no longer the young heartthrob she once was. But that final day, it was flawless. It made all the prior arguments and complaints seem trivial. We were gearing up for one last run before dinner when it all went down. Your mom, not exactly proficient on the snowboard, chose skis instead. As we approached the hill, we noticed a commercial shoot in progress. Your mom got overly excited, attempting to ski through the shoot, unnoticed by the crew focused on their models. In her attempt to grab attention, she lost track of her path, veering into a challenging run. Without looking, she ended up charging down an expert trail. Our ski instructor wouldn't even dare to take those slopes. In one moment, she was making poses for cameras not even aimed at her, and the next, she was hurtling down, leading to a loud crash as she collided with a tree. I was one of the first to reach her, and the sight was surreal. There she was, embracing the tree in a way you'd never imagine. 
knocked unconscious, with limbs awkwardly draped around the trunk. The ski patrol hesitated to move her, promptly calling for medical help. A helicopter was dispatched to take her to the nearest hospital. Thankfully, we were in Michigan, surrounded by top-notch medical facilities. Heidi spent three days unconscious before she finally woke up, which was fortunate given the critical care she needed during that time. Over those days, she underwent four surgeries to address her severe injuries. The first procedure fixed her broken nose, a delicate operation given the risk of bone fragments causing brain damage. Thankfully, it was successful, greatly reducing the risk to her life. The next day, surgeons tackled her spine, repairing several displaced discs that threatened her mobility. This operation was intricate and lengthy, but it promised a full recovery, including the ability to walk again. The surgeries that followed were less complex but no less important, involving the insertion of pins in each of her wrists, broken in her attempt to shield herself. Aside from the extensive bruising that painted her face and body, Heidi was on the road to recovery. When Heidi finally emerged from unconsciousness, her mental faculties appeared unaffected. Recalling a personal anecdote I shared with my daughter, Sarah, about a past accident and the importance of family in those first moments of recovery. Heidi's initial words upon waking were a mix of exasperation and concern for her appearance, which, at the time, seemed trivial to me, relieved just to hear her speak. Heidi's recovery journey extended beyond the hospital, requiring a stay in a specialized facility for continued rehabilitation. Despite several closer options, she chose a facility near East Lansing, almost 90 miles from our home. I speculated it was to be closer to Sarah, who was returning to college, and perhaps, by extension, Sarah's new boyfriend, Justin, who worked there. I committed myself to daily visits, a routine that spanned the entire duration of her stay. The first few weeks passed without incident, a period I later realized was marked by my own naivety. I remember that day vividly, as though it just happened. I arrived earlier than usual because the traffic was surprisingly light, allowing me to speed up and enjoy the drive. Normally, I would reach the hospital just after Heidi was assisted with her morning routine due to her recent recovery. Despite regaining strength in her legs, she was still unsteady, hence the use of a wheelchair for safety. Following her shower, she would have breakfast, undergo a few tests, and then it would be time for visitors. I typically arrived by 9 a.m., so showing up at 8 was out of the ordinary. To my surprise, Heidi wasn't in her room when I was let in. I had planned a surprise visit, but instead, I found myself hiding in the small bathroom, awaiting her return. This period was a highlight of our marriage. We were closer than ever, making plans for the future and genuinely enjoying each other's company. I was convinced of her love for me, a feeling I cherished deeply. After decades together, it felt like a victory, a dream realized, albeit much later in our lives. My anticipation turned to disbelief as a man entered, assisting Heidi back into her bed but then, unexpectedly, he locked the door and approached her with an intimacy that was clearly not new to them. The scene that unfolded before me shattered my heart. Their actions, meant to be hidden, revealed a betrayal that was impossible to ignore. I remained concealed, paralyzed by the shock of the revelation. The realization hit me hard. The future I had envisioned with Heidi crumbled in an instant. Our children were grown, there was nothing holding me back from making a decisive move. Without confronting the situation directly, I left the hospital, ignoring Heidi's attempts to contact me as I drove away. I took immediate action, consulting a lawyer to begin the process of ending our marriage and securing my financial independence. I left her with a small sum, a token gesture amidst the tumult of severing our ties. This marked the end of a chapter in my life, one that closed with a heavy heart but a resolve to move forward. I made arrangements with a real estate agent for a swift sale of our house. With the market in our area at a peak, I secured an excellent offer of $411,000 for it. Deciding to move on, I rented a sizable truck, packed up my belongings, and hitched my car to a trailer. After changing my phone number, I embarked on a new journey. I left behind letters for each of you, tucked in with the divorce documents, aware that the distance between us would prompt you to reach out once you received them. I included my lawyer's details, instructing him to share my new contact information with you, ensuring I remained reachable to you but not to Heidi. Little did I expect Heidi's actions to deprive her own children or prevent you from receiving my messages. My drive took me through various states, each stop offering a glimpse into different communities. The journey ended in Florida, drawn by its vibrant community and the familiar presence of Michigan expatriates. The first year was a quiet one, focusing solely on settling in and starting a small business in property management, catering to homeowners who spend their time elsewhere. Eventually, I began exploring the local social scene, not quite ready to dive back into dating but open to meeting new people. I encountered a variety of individuals, some reminding me of the past in ways that were less than pleasant. Despite the mix of reactions, my experiences in the social sphere led me to meet Sam, a story for another time. Heidi's pleas fell on deaf ears as I confronted the reality of our situation. Her excuses couldn't mask the years of disappointment. I had a feeling something was amiss that day, Heidi began. 
The nurse mentioned she'd seen you around, even mentioned you heading upstairs. Yeah, I did go upstairs, but only to ensure Justin was no longer working there, I shared. It never crossed my mind that you'd actually go through with letting him tie the knot with Sarah. Justin's face drained of color. Why is Justin being brought into this, Dad? Sarah inquired, confusion lacing her voice. He was involved in something with your mom, I disclosed. That's when chaos erupted. Sarah made a beeline for Justin, who scrambled to flee. David managed to catch him first, aiming a punch his way. I accidentally caused Justin to stumble right in front of Sarah, leading to both Sarah and Samantha giving him a piece of their mind. Eventually, Justin found an opening and dashed out of the house. For the next hour, Kelly and I were there for Sarah, soothing her turmoil, while the others congregated below. Kelly gave her something to help her relax, and soon enough, Sarah was sound asleep. She's decided to leave him. She's meeting with a lawyer tomorrow, Kelly announced when she rejoined us. An awkward silence followed until Heidi broke it. James, in the three years you've been away, I've done a lot of thinking. I'm scheduled for a hospital visit tomorrow for some tests. I really hope you can be there for me. Mom, are you serious? David couldn't hide his disbelief. Sasha was blunt. She's impossible. I want what's mine now, or I'll ensure you regret it. Kelly tried to mediate, reminding Heidi of her prolonged stay despite having the means for independence. But I cut in, no, Kelly. If anything, Heidi has been the one taking us in. She's always had a way of making her presence felt, for better or worse. But now, we're reunited, and that's what counts. Let's plan a family get-together in Florida for Christmas. Realizing the time, I signaled it was time to head out. We'll make it happen, Dad, David assured, ready to assist with the departure. James, how can you consider leaving, especially now? Because he's loyal to me, Grandma, Sam said with frustration. I handed Sam her coat, and she began to wear it. She gave me a quick peck on the cheek. James, you can't just walk away from me, Heidi protested loudly. It'll haunt you. You've always come back to me, and this time won't be different. You're mine. No, Sam interjected, positioning herself before Heidi. He's with me now, wishing you the best day ever. Forget you, Heidi retorted with venom. He sure does, Samantha replied with a bright tone. And that's how we're expecting a baby. We arrived at the airport with minutes to spare, navigating through the snowy roads in our little V6 convertible, but made it safely and headed home to Florida. During Christmas, David, Kelly, Sarah, and Sasha visited us in Florida. They all had a great time and went out of their way to pamper Sam, who was visibly pregnant by then. Sarah decided to stay with us, which was wonderful as she was trying to piece her life together after separating from Justin. Despite Heidi's frequent attempts to reach out, nobody was willing to engage with her, and eventually, she stopped calling. A few weeks later, I had to meet with my lawyer. Heidi and I had prepared wills before our separation, and she hadn't made any changes to hers. Sadly, Heidi passed away in the hospital alone after a mysterious illness, possibly linked to her past or a genetic condition like her mother's, baffled the doctors until her last day. In her final days, Heidi was a shadow of her former self, having passed away under distressing circumstances. I decided to distribute the inheritance equally among my children. We might someday share with our youngest about the tumultuous past, but it's not a priority. The final step was to attend Heidi's funeral. Despite the pouring rain, many had already left, with only a few attendees, including an unexpected appearance from Justin, probably hoping to reconcile with Sarah. As the rain intensified, the officiant suggested we expedite the burial due to the weather. We agreed to proceed with the traditional gesture of laying soil on the coffin before heading to David and Kelly's for a gathering. Lining up for the ceremony, we watched as the equipment was prepared to seal the grave, a challenging task in the worsening weather. At the graveside service, only a few people were there, and they weren't family members. They glanced briefly into the grave before making their way back to their vehicles. I tried to stand next to Sarah, but she subtly moved away, positioning herself in front of me. Justin, attempting to follow, ended up behind her. David, sensing tension, stayed close to my side. Suddenly, the person operating the bulldozer prepared to fill the grave, revving the engine loudly as a signal to us. I signaled back, realizing he couldn't see us through the machinery. Seizing a moment when no one was looking, I nudged Justin with a forceful elbow, sending him tumbling into the grave. Only Sarah and David noticed. Justin's shouts were drowned out by the bulldozer's noise. He tried to grasp the edge of the grave, but the rain had made the sides too slippery for him to climb out. A strange calm washed over me. My anger towards Heidi, who had pursued her desires at great cost, vanished. She had lived passionately, albeit alone in her final moments. Now, it seemed fitting that Justin, her last partner, would join her in the afterlife. As Justin struggled to hold on, I stepped on his hands, causing him to fall back. The bulldozer then moved in, burying both the casket and Justin under a heavy layer of mud. There was no sign of movement from the grave. I wondered if the shock of the fall or the weight of the mud had immobilized him. In an ideal world, they would have shared the casket, but life is far from ideal. My love for Heidi had blinded me, forgiving her more times than I should have. Yet, in the end, I reclaimed my dignity and moved on. I prioritized my children's well-being over everything, a choice not every guy would make. My comment, 
Dude caught her cheating every two years for 20 straight, then she admits that she got away with five times that amount. So that's conservatively 50 different lovers she had. Sounds unreal, but I have heard something similar from a friend before. 